Well, thank you both for being here. So what did you think about the results in general? Did they, did they surprise you? Um, why, why not? So, um, no, I, I don't think the, the results surprised me very much. The, 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 I, without wanting to be arrogant, the, the fundamental problem is that patients come in, they're, so, they're overwhelmed with this diagnosis of leukaemia, um, and they tend to rely on, on the doctor to make the best treatment decision. And, and so, you know, at the moment, we've, as you know, we've got a whole lot of variety of drugs that we can give patients. What, what I tend to do is give them written information about each drug, but actually make a pretty strong recommendation that I think this is the, the best drug for them. Um, and, and is it a two-way discussion? Not, not so much in the sense that the patients know nothing about, C, about CML. I mean, they've been given some information about it. For them to make, to make judgments of imatinib versus nilotinib versus dasatinib is really not their area um of i mean i mean we're happy to discuss it with them but we we know the drugs we know the side effects we know the best indications we know the response rates and particularly in the modern era when we know that we can use doses of drugs with far less side effects than previously reported particularly with the satinib that in in a sense we are a bit authoritarian and tell them what we think is the best thing to do um, I, I haven't had m many patients, to be honest, sort of um, debate with me the alternatives. Do you find that, um, you know, in the age of Google, lots of information out there, um, support groups and all of that, um, you wouldn't say that more so than, I don't know, two decades ago? Yeah, no, no, no they do. Yeah. Look, there's, there's, there's a lot of heterogeneity, heterogeneity between patients. There's some, some patients just want to know the very bare minimum. I mean, mm -hmm. even after a year, they still don't know what a BCR able is, where other patients are all over the place, um, you know, and, and Google everything. I mean, we have a patient information sheet that we give them about what is CML, et cetera, et cetera. Some patients read it and some patients don't. Mm -hmm. um, we have a we have an information sheet about each drug. Um, but, but, but ultimately... To be honest, in, in practice, it's generally myself that makes the decision what we think the most appropriate drug is. You know, I'd say to you, Lisa, I think the best drug for you is is Lotinib, for example, because of A, B, and C. And I'll explain why. But there's not usually a debate about it. Well, you know, I had a... I, I'll be honest, I had a lot of troubles with the study to begin with. And part of the problem is the heterogeneity of where people are coming from and where those doctors are coming from, because things are very different. Let, let's start with something very basic. I sit on the ELN Guidelines Committee, and we split on that committee as to what the endpoint of treatment should be. There's some real aggressive physicians that say we go for molecular and, uh, endpoints and treatment for remission and things like that. And then there's all, some of us who say, well, the actual goal for a patient, what's important to them, is they survive, they live a fairly normal life, they don't have side effects of their treatment. Now, some may bugs them if they stay on treatments, go off treatment, things of that nature, but that's another issue. So there really is this whole issue of what is important. I think we as doctors tend to be too number directed in terms of, of where we're going. And I think you now that we know how to handle a lot of long-term side effects, some like the things like that, a person has to take one pill a day for the rest of their lives without side effects is going to do pretty damn well. And mm -hmm. as the late John Golden says, they have a they have a, a remission, although they don't come off the drug. They, they have a, a type of cure. So I think, again, in terms of what's recommended, well, you get a naive patient who's, someone's given them a diagnosis before they even set foot in Andrew in my office, and they're already trying to think of what they should get in terms of treatment. And they've gone on and said, gone to Dr. Google. And let's be honest, there's some great sites out there that they can pick up. We have to assess that patient when we see them. I think most of all, there's different venues that this study covered. What is a, you say we dictate a drug. Well, there's certain provinces in Canada where the, your drugs are paid for by that province and you have one choice for your first line treatment. 
It's not that I'm telling him that drug A is better than drug B. That province has dictated that this is the drug. There are some countries in the world where you can't get some of the drugs that are out there. So to go online and say, I want drug D when drug A is the only one available is very significant. The other thing you have to know is who's reimbursing it. Can you afford that drug? And then finally, you definitely, we have to take a good history and do a physical examination on that patient. The patient, they say they want a drug that has significant cardiovascular side effects, but they have cardiovascular issues to begin with. And they may want that, but we have to decide that it's not the best. So in a case where I have all the options available and I've assessed the patient, I will say, well, this is what we can get for you. This is what's reimbursed. This is the endpoint we're looking at. This is what I would recommend based on you as a person and what you might tolerate in a lifestyle. Someone who's uh, an airline pilot and is halfway across the world is, is not going to do so well taking a twice a day drug. So someone whose eating habits are not good may not do well doing the drug that has to be taken on a full stomach versus an empty stomach. So, so I think it's... We're not being paternalistic. There may be very much reasons why some of those patients were told that this is the drug they should take. That may be the only option they had. And I think the problem with the, the Sun Papers, you didn't break down the demographics and where those people were coming from and what were the options. And it may very well be that what they got was all they could get. But isn't, I mean, if you look at it, the more maybe not so specific just in terms of treatment decisions but maybe just in terms of communication as well I think a lot of patients are you know feel that um, there isn't really a lot of open communication with their with their doctors depends what you mean by communication and I will be totally the first to say that because I've had physicians myself personally who sit behind a computer screen and don't communicate with you as one iota and others who are very open and getting into your lifestyle and how things are affected and what you need and what things bother you, and that's fine. And that that may be a, definitely a doctor issue, and that may just be the doctor, and it may not, because I don't think we're formatted in any way to deal with things. The other thing, you may come and you have a, a, a patient, as Andrew said, who doesn't know that much to begin with, is, a, is more or less educated, uh, less able to look things up for themselves, who who you have to speak to at a different level than someone who comes in with a PhD in microbiology or molecular pathology that you can go into the intricacies of PCR technology and things of that nature. So, you know, we, we have to switch horses as, through this whole process. Yeah. It was all what I would be. They're not all the same. That's, I mean, so at least in my clinic yesterday, I saw an 88-year-old Italian person who doesn't talk English from a nursing home who's got CML. Um, so, so for me to sort of have an exhaustive discussion of all various alternatives was just completely inappropriate. Whereas in you know in in the same clinic, there's a there was a 45-year-old man with relatively newly diagnosed CML, in which we had a sort of quite quite a long discussion. So it, it um, one size doesn't fit all. How um, how do you, how do you encourage that kind of communication? So okay, so we've decided what the treatment is going to be, um, but how do we have conversations that are meaningful around side effects? For example, like how do you know your patient's taking the medication the right way? What if side effects are so terrible that they're not taking the you know the medication the right way? They're not explaining, uh, which all impacts outcomes. Um, how do you what do you do in those situations? So I have this sort of approach over these because I realize the compliance is a major issue in CML because the people have got no symptoms. Um, and I say to my patients, this is just like having hypertension. If you take your tablet, you won't have uncontrolled hypertension, you won't get a stroke. You take your tablet, um, your, life, your lifespan will be normal. I also say to them when they walk in and say, oh, I assume they've missed their drug and they sort of say, oh, how are you going? And how, how often have you missed, a, missed your tablet in the last two or three months? That's my that's my opening line to to sort of make it easy for them to be able to admit. Like I don't say to them, "Are you taking your tablets every day?" Mm -hmm. uh, because that that's a that, then they would adopt a defensive posture. I say to them, "Oh yeah, look, I know it's really difficult to take tablets every day. How often have you missed it in the last couple of months?" And I say, "Oh, look, I missed you know two or three days when I went overseas or whatever." Bloody blah, blah, blah. So 
I, I then get an idea of, of compliance in a non-confronting way. Um, and and compliance is a is a major issue, as you know, particularly in, in younger patients. Um, and, and then when we're talking, when we talk about side effects, I mean, often patients with CML have some mild fatigue. Dr. Lipton, can you add to that? Well, I, I think I, one of the things COVID taught me very much is the importance of having a significant other, whether it's a parent, child, spouse, partner who comes in with them. Because you sit there and ask a patient if they're having any side effects, things going around the patient, and no, nothing. And, the, and the, the person who's come with them is looking at the sky or shaking their head like, let's go a little deeper here. You, sometimes you have to probe a little more. And it's not trying to make the patient defensive, but sometimes the patient doesn't want to tell you. They're afraid you'll stop their drug, which seems to be working because of side effects, you move them on to something different. They don't want to upset you. They don't want to upset the person they're with. They may not even realize they're having a side effect that's related to that particular drug. And of course, there you have to go a little deeper because some of the side effects are so vague, such as the fatigue that Andrew said. It's the studies show it's 30 to 40 percent of patients on these drugs. It's the major side effect. But let's go into the fatigue. You know, are they depressed? Are they not sleeping? Are they working odd hours? Do they have sleep apnea? You know, I found all sorts of reasons for this. So yes, you can be very general and try not to make the patient go on the defensive, but to improve the communications, I think the one thing that's missing, communications is a two-way street. We can open the door for communications. We can emphasize the need for compliance, which is the big reason that people fail. Like 90% of people fail because of compliance, not because the drug hasn't worked. So yes, communication is profoundly important, not just in medicine with anything, but it's a two-way communication. Way. You know, if the patient is not opening up, if the patient is not answering the questions honestly, that's a problem. You know, if the doctor is not giving the patient the opportunity, that's a sin. Yes, doctors have to communicate well, but as, as Jeff said, you know, there is a bit of an onus on the patient to be honest and, and, and to speak their mind. I mean, what, one of the other issues, we do have limited time with patients. You know, in, in my clinic, you have, I have, I have a quarter of an hour for, for review. And so once, for any patient, you know, once, once you've spoken to them, you've examined them, you've looked at their blood results, you've dictated a letter, you've written their scripts, et cetera, et cetera. You know, this, this utopian, uh, the utopian sort of ideal that we've got 20 minutes to discuss all their side effects and their quality of life, et cetera, et cetera, in detail, doesn't always exist. So how, how can patients manage that, though, the best? Do you think we should come in with a big list? Well, yes, I think, I think patients definitely need to come in with a list of issues that are bothering them. Because the first thing we have to do is determine, is that necessarily related to either the CML or the treatment? Or it's related to something else, in which case we have to arrange for other testing, other referrals, back to the family doctor, et cetera, et cetera. But we, need, we should give the patient the opportunity, is something bothering you? Are you having any side effects that you think may be related to your treatment? The patient has to be able to answer that, whether they come in with a list that they're gonna raise the issues or they're gonna to respond to me. We have to give, give the patient the opportunity. We have to maybe give some something to hang the patient on. The patient must come in. Now, if the patient say we're not communicating because they ask a question we do not answer, that, that's terrible. That's absolutely terrible. But if we give the patient the opportunity and they don't respond, I can we can't go into their heads and pick things out. Dr. Greg, do you have thoughts on that? Like how, how do you help your patients, um, I guess, feel comfortable enough to um, to get all their, their issues addressed? Yeah, I, I suppose um, Jeff's question about coming in with a list. I mean, some people come in with pages and pages of, of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I sometimes have to say, well, give me your top four. Um, yes. But, um, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit sport, Lisa, because I sit in my patients. I've got a CML nursing coordinator um, mm. who sits with my patients. And uh, my patients have their, their telephone number within the hospital or they have their email address. And so so that, that they I have a support person there that patients are able to deal with issues outside the, the context of a consultation. And I think that's, I find that really helpful in a large CML clinic. Um, I, I, I suppose... What I'm sort of learning now is that perhaps I could say to my patients each time I see them when I when I when they leave the room I could say well next time come in and bring a list of any major issues that, that you have so we can discuss them next time I don't usually say that but perhaps that's something that I should mm -hmm. yeah I yeah, get the patients to come in with information just just getting to come in with an accurate list of other medications they're taking is sometimes extremely difficult. Yeah. yeah the, the other issue is, of course, is asking questions and questioning is really a cultural phenomenon. You know, we in the Western world expect this very open, but there are certain cultures that patients don't ask. I think, though, that there's one big similarity, though, right, is that the, it's the diagnosis of cancer. And I think some, yeah. uh, I mean, many patients, especially if they haven't gotten any information before they land in your office, um, yeah, I think that there is for many patients a perception that you know you don't want to ask questions of the doctor, right? What's called the Leukemia Foundation in in Victoria that have booklets that that I've been actually involved in updating, so that we give uh, the Leukemia Foundation booklet on CML to the patient, which goes through what it is, what is a BCR able, et cetera, et cetera. So they they're given that at their first consultation if they haven't got that already. And then they usually, usually actually go off with my CML coordinator and have a bit of a discussion about it all. Um, the other, the other thing practically in a major centre like mine is that probably eighty percent of the patients will go into clinical trial. So w while we may discuss other options, often there's a bit of a focus on 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 going on the clinical trial and why why that's important. Now that's that's not covered in the Sun survey, but that's in fact what happens at the large academic centres. Um, and you also have to be a little bit careful when you first see a patient not to overwhelm them with too much information ah, yes. because it goes in one ear and out the other after a while. Um, and so, um, you know, when you first see them and they may have been, been put on hydroxyurea for the last week, you've got to, you've got to A, get the social background and the psychological background of the patient, get to know them a little bit, make them feel at ease with you examine them, look at their counts, et cetera, et cetera, and then, and then sort of make a recommendation about a drug on top of all that, often at the first consultation, which can be um, difficult for a patient to understand everything when, when there's a lot of information coming at them from all angles. And I think that's perhaps part of the reason why there may be um, perhaps somewhat limited communication about what, what options are available because they're exhausted by by the end of a consult and mm -hmm. they probably just want to know, just give me the drug that, that I think is going to be the best for me. And, and that sort of tend to be what happens. Mm -hmm. you, you can't at the end of a half an hour getting to know a patient go through realistically through all the drug options and for them to understand that all. That, that they're too exhausted by that. Leukemia word is very scary to patients. So I, I, relatively early in the conversation, I say, I've never heard whether it's a Latin root or, the, or some other Greek root. You know, I say Luke means white. Anemia means blood. It just means excess white cells in the blood. And there are, you know, a hundred different forms of leukemia. This is one of the best ones to have. So don't be scared by that word. So this, this when the study came out, a lot of um, people and the patients in the global community thought that it really outlined some gaps in care. So communication obviously is one of them, but that leads to other things like maybe, you know, maybe we're not on the treatment that we think we should be on, or maybe we're not having the opportunity to talk about our quality of life. So our quality of life, um, you know, isn't as good maybe as it could be because we're not having this communication. Um, and so generally the, con the uh, conclusion was that there are some gaps in care um, in CML. And um, I mean, we have medication, so it's generally well treated, um, but are there other gaps in care that you can identify? Um. Look, I mean, I, I think overall, Lisa, that the 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 patients with CML in my hospital are probably the best best looked after. I mean, they, they, they generally 
you know, as you know, that they, they generally do very well. Um, most of them have a reasonable understanding of what's going on with their disease. You know, o over time, sometimes that can take three to six months for them to really understand what's going on. Um, uh, you know, do, do we communicate sufficiently well about about side effects? Perhaps we could be, you know, perhaps we could be a little bit more inquisitive and a little bit more open to patients feeling as though they can come into a consultation with some pre-prepared questions. And perhaps that's something I've learned from today. We could, I could do a little bit more about that. Um, I, 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 uh, I don't generally see, you know, apart from tinkering around at the edges about making sure that patients are able to feel comfortable in having a conversation with us and telling them what's going on and not feel as though they have to please us. I, I think in general we do okay. But perhaps I'm perhaps I'm just at one end of the spectrum and I've got a, a different perspective. But it's 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 not the sense that I get that patients are really frustrated with what's happening with them. But most of them are doing very well. Most of them are working full time. Some of them will have some you know, moderate side effects, but but are usually able to get on with their lives. The fatigue in most patients is not disabling. It it does affect perhaps their quality of life to a degree, but that's the price in a sense they have to pay. I don't see a massive gore, um, sort of awning chasm that we're missing, but. I think the majority of patients have the opportunity in a good setting. Now, not always. We get patients who may be seen in, in smaller centers where CML is not a major, major uh, part of that practice who maybe don't get as much time as a patient with breast cancer or something. So maybe very different versus being in an academic center such as ours. So that may be an issue. And I'm not saying it is. Look, if you're if you're an oncologist in the community and you've got 10 or patients, 20 CML patients, and you've got two, 300 breast cancer patients and all these other ones, you know, it's, it's relative of what you can do. So I'm sure there are gaps. I'm sure there are individual gaps. Are there system gaps? That I think you have to look at. Are there system gaps? And I think it depends. There's the whole CML system and then there's the individual doctor system and set where you want to break it up. Yeah, there may be gaps in certain cases like that. But are there systemic gaps, systematic gaps? I don't know that there are, at least not in the Western world with good hospitals. Yeah, I, I think... I, I think in any, as I say to my sons, uh, only one of whom's, well, one of whom's a hematologist, I say in any job you do, whether it's being law or working in a shop, is communication is probably the most important skill that you have. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that applies across, across all facets of life with, with your family, with your friends, you communicate, you know, honestly and openly. And so I think, you know, the, the, the fact that communication is, is you know less than ideal in some aspects of the study does not surprise me at all because I think that's generic to any any interpersonal interaction. I I, I don't I, I don't see that as a a systematic gap in semen. I think it's just a part of the nature of human relationships. Thank you.